April 13th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we review the Battle for Wesnoth, an amazing turn-based strategy game for the PC. Let's do this. This is a very momentous occasion for Geek Nights, for you see... On another show, indirectly, we have probably received what I would call our first actual legitimate hate mail ever. Well, I mean, I think we've gotten things before that they were like they might have been considered hate mail, but no one was actually really hating us, or we weren't a hundred percent sure that they were not kidding. And well, there was that one that started out okay, but then it went a little weird at the end, and there was that Admiral Beefy or whatever his name is thing, but. Uh, if that was actually real, I feel sorry for that dude. <laughs> yeah, that dude's a scary dude. But real no, scary. Uh, this is not the... I'd like to play a clip. We're not going to talk about this tonight since it's Tuesday and it has nothing to do with video games at all. I don't even know why we're playing it tonight. That was all rim. Well, I thought that it was hilarious. And furthermore, to make sure that you get the entirety of the hilarity, I edited out everything but the actual craziness from the response we got to a fairly innocent question that Scott asked a fellow podcaster. There are multiple questions here. Do you think that if I concentrate hard enough, I could kill him with the power of my mind? The thing is, like, his email is stupid for reasons that have nothing to do with the fact that it's not It's a fundamentally... It doesn't take all our fucking powers combined because this is such a retarded question that, no, any one of us could answer this. Even if it was Shoujo, you would still be a condescending sexist asshole. Oh, it's straight up sci-fi, so it couldn't possibly be Shoujo? You don't want to say that a Shoujo work could be on par with Tezuka? I think Hagi Omoto, you know, the female Tezuka as she's referred to, would have something to fucking say about that, first off. Do you have any idea what Shoujo means? Do you have any idea what these classifications mean in Japan? She's one of the women who helped to fucking define shoujo. God, how insulting is this? Like, I just can't get over how dismissive this email is of shoujo manga. Insinuating that, oh, how could such a solid sci-fi series possibly be a girl's manga? And that kind of thing. As if to imply that only guys... Girls really... can't write sci-fi. <laughs> you know, it doesn't excuse the stupidity of this email, though. What? Mm. What? That's retarded. There's no words for how retarded that is. And I guess it pisses me off more because, like, this is geek nights. I mean, these guys do a podcast where they talk about anime. And you guys are always boasting about how much you know, Misters, we ran the RIT Anime Club. So our otaku cock is the biggest. What now? No, I'm not cool with this. If that's the kind of hate mail we get, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what uh, what her problem is. She figured out our secret, if anything. Our otaku cock is, in fact, that big. She must have spied it from space. Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was that eclipse. Maybe she was just getting pissed off at it poking her in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, uh, it's video games, right? Well, games in general. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you haven't heard, the Xbox 360 Elite... Elite. Is coming out. Now, this really, really reeks of Ultra Fark. Why was it reek of Ultra Fark? Well, in terms of... People always joke about how stratified Fark is. At least people in Fark. How there's Fark, and then there's the people who are so rich and beyond that they can afford the five bucks a month or whatever to get that little total Fark icon next to their name. Even though I've been tempted to buy it a couple times. Mostly because it also gives you the ability on Fark to block people. Uh, well... This Xbox 360 Elite is an Xbox 360. It's going to be out on April 29th, and it's a bit different from the Xbox 360s that are currently available. So it's not just a money grab? Uh, no, not really. Well, yes, no, it depends. First of all, it's black, as Uh opposed to white. So it's, you mean it's the same color as the original Xbox, or all the consoles from the previous generation, except the GameCube? Yeah, it's basically... Color of the old Xbox, shape of the new Xbox. I always thought it was interesting how everything kind of went white, and now Mm. (laughs) Microsoft's like, oh, check this out, black. Yeah, it's pretty much people only know how to do industrial design with two colors these days. It's white and black, and either the, you know, they'll do white as the default, and then the special one is black. You know, and meanwhile, before it was black was normal, and the special one is white. It's like, (laughs) what the hell, just... 
It's just the color. It doesn't mean anything. Well, I'm seeing this in cars lately. I'm looking at cars just because my current car might possibly be on its last legs. I got to see how much it's going to cost to fix part of the coolant system. Mm -hmm. But all the cars I looked at, I went to a bunch of dealers that were around. 90% of them are either white, black, or gray. Yeah. Actually, when I was buying my current car, there was like a selection of like 10 to 12 colors you could pick for the car. But, like, two of them, like, I remember one of them was, like, this pearl white something that cost more than the other colors. And I'm like, what the hell? It's just it's just a different color. Why, why are you charging more for one color? Yeah, it's not like you're buying the gold-plated Mazda 3. Shouldn't that that could cost more. Shouldn't the engine be the part that costs more? Anyway. Also, this elite Xbox 360 will have a 120 gigabyte hard drive. Aha! Uh-huh. Well, which is, that's actually a good thing because, well... Xboxes right now don't have big enough hard drives, so when people download all this extra stuff and they play a lot of games and they start downloading videos and demos, they run out of room real quick. Especially since this whole XLive download stuff thing is going really well, and I gotta say, I applaud Microsoft for their efforts. Secondly, they're adding in, well, thirdly, I guess, they're adding an HDMI port, so you don't have to use component cables for HD, you can use the HDMI cable for HD. Uh Uh-huh. Uh... I'm of the mind that I, I'm not 100% sure that there is no difference in the visual quality when using a component cable versus an HDMI cable, but I'm pretty sure that the majority of people could not tell the difference in a double blind. I'd really like to see some double blinds. I remember I reading would. double blinds from the audiophile people who couldn't tell the difference between some super elite audiophile awesome gold cable system and a 1989 boombox. Yep. Also, this Xbox 360 is $480. Uh Aha. So what this has done, really, I mean, if you think about it, it's not that much better than the Xbox 360 Premium, which is like $300, right? Because, I mean, what does it have? It has a HDMI hole, which isn't a significant difference. It has a significantly larger hard drive, but that hard drive is going to be available separately for $180. Which, basically, if you bought an Xbox 360 Premium and the hard drive, it would cost just as much as the Elite 360. But then you also get the HDMI port, and you don't have to have this extra thing. Now, the problem that everyone's complaining about is, of course, the things this Elite doesn't have. First of all, it doesn't have that HD DVD drive built in. It has just the regular drive, so you still need that external HD DVD drive to watch the HD DVD movies with it. It doesn't have freaking wireless internet so you still have to connect it to the internet with a cable which is granted, the, that's the number one complaint granted for us at least the wii by default only comes with wireless and i'd rather it just had an ethernet hole so i could plug it in i don't know wireless i think is better because it increases a lot of play in your house i mean most people don't have a wire in oh yeah house i like agree for no, for 99 percent of people the wireless is better right also if you're going places with your system which you tend to do with the game console these days it's you're not gonna be able to get a wire near your system. You're gonna need to use a wireless, like yeah. in a hotel or something. So wireless these days, at least, is generally better than wired. And having wired only on the 360 really means that a lot of people are not gonna be able to use the Xbox Live. And if you're not using the Xbox Live, why buy an Xbox? See, I say for us mostly because we happen to have a switch sitting next to the TV that really wants to be used by more than one device. Yeah, just because we're 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 geeks and we have a cable down there. <laughs> see, what's happening here, actually, is a lot of people are seeing this, and they're saying, all right, first of all, that hard drive is way overpriced. 120 gigs for $180. You could buy a better hard drive than that at the store. For a PC, you can buy a 750 gigabyte hard drive for like 120 bucks. Granted, this is a 2.5 inch hard drive and not a 3.5 inch, but that's not that big a deal these days anymore. The thing is, this is $480. PS3 is six hundred dollars. Well, the high end PS3. What about the low end PS3? The low end PS3 is about the same as this thing. Ha! Huh. So it actually kind of makes the PS3 look okay. Yeah. I, I mean, just... what they should have done is they should have brought this out and charged the same amount of money for this as they charge for the high end Xbox 360, and then lower the prices on the other 360s that already exist. Then they wouldn't make the PS3 look so good. But then again, while the PS3 is looking a little better now that Little Big World, which is perhaps the only game I have seen that, well, I'm not going to buy a PS3. If I were the kind of person who could be swayed to buy a PS3, that game would have done it. Yeah, 
the PlayStation 2 and the PlayStation 1 had all sorts of great games, and it looks like even though developers, you know, are not so hip to the PS3 as they were, there's still going to be a whole bunch of awesome type games for it, probably in the long run, but it's just not worth the money, at least not right now. Yeah, especially since there has been a lot of talk that IBM and other companies have been refining the manufacturing process of the cell chip. And while not in the near future, so no one who really wants a PS3 can worry about it, in the long run, the PS3 is going to get a lot cheaper. Like Probably. every piece of technology in the history of technology has. Yeah, I mean, when I'm 30-something years old, I'll probably be able to get a PS3 for like $100. Granted, look at us. We're now balking at paying nothing to get a PS2. <laughs> Granted, true. part of that is that if we get a PS2, we're going to play Guitar Heroes. And if we play Guitar Heroes, we're not going to have any time to do anything else in our lives for at least a month. Probably not. Uh, yeah, so Xbox 360 Elite is really not that elite. And the other thing is the head, it comes with a, with the headset, so you know you can talk to people, but it comes with a wired headset instead of the wireless one. Ah. It's like, what if you're going to make the Elite, why don't you give it, like, with everything? Give people a full set of controllers. Give people four wireless headsets. Give people the HD DVD drive, the biggest hard drive, the best everything. Make it the full set. Well, you know what they're probably going to do? They Charge had, the same amount of money. There was the Xbox. Now there's going to be the, the Xbox Y-box. Elite. And then there's going to be the Xbox Complete. Yeah. And it's going to have everything. And it's going to cost slightly more than the Elite costs. I don't know. I don't even know why they bother. Like, if Oh, you- I know why. <sighs> because people are going to buy it. They're going to make money off of this. They're going to make a lot of money. because I don't Xbox- know. The, it seems to like the news is saying, or at least the word on the internet, which is completely unreliable, is like, Oh, hardcore people aren't liking the Elite. They're all complaining about it. Well, that is the one issue. Hardcore people already own an Xbox. Yes, but the PD word is also that, you know, if hardcore people don't buy it, then there won't be the trickling down to the non-hardcore people. I don't know. I think people who don't care about how much money it costs and don't have a 360 already will probably buy the Elite one just for the bigger hard drive. And, you know, if you have an HDMI TV... My, the HDMI port, you might as well use it. It's not going to hurt you. Well, plus, regardless of the possible future potential of the PS3, right now, the Xbox has a lot more to offer. So even if you pay this premium for the Xbox, which is comparable to the price for a low-end PS3, I think you get a lot more out of the deal. Yeah, you definitely get something for it. But it's still, they're giving you, they're shorthanding you. I also think it doesn't cost Microsoft very much more to make this thing. And I imagine every one they sell is pure profit. Uh, probably. So, if you want one, April 29th, $480. So, there's been a lot of buzz about the PSP lately, which has also been really surprising, because the PSP was launched and almost immediately fell flat. And its sales were absolutely nothing compared to the DS. Even the early days of the DS, it was just selling like hotcakes relative. Mm -hmm. And then UMD failed, and there weren't any games for the PSP, and a lot of the mainstream gaming press kind of forgot about it. Recently, the PSP, while it's definitely not doing well, went from an also ran to a doing kind of okay. Going to be a decent second place. Well, as soon as they stopped paying attention to those stupid UMD crap movie things, and they just said, all right, let's make some games for this, turns out that some people actually made some games for the PSP, and there's quite a few of them out there. Yeah, if I owned a PSP, I'd probably buy three or four games right now. Yeah, it's like I look at that PSP shelf, and I I see some good stuff there. It's almost like Sony realized that everything they had done for the past couple years had been an abortion. So they decided, (laughs) all right, let's do a couple things smart. Let's make a game called Little Big Planet, and let's make games for the PSP. And, now this is the news, let's lower the price of the PSP, 30 bucks. All right. $170 is not that bad. That's only PS3. 40 more than a DS. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, because the PSP, while it doesn't have the nearly the, the library that the DS has, the PSP does have the fact that you can listen to podcasts on it. You can download. It's the only thing that I've heard of. The only reasonable reasonably available common device that you can get that can subscribe to and download and listen to podcasts all in one portable device. Also, there are some fantastic NES emulators (laughs) for the PSP. And in fact, everyone I've ever met who had a PSP proudly showed me their NES emulator and their giant pile of ROMs. Another thing I've noticed about the PSP is that they've realized, I guess, a lot of people who own it like, you know, the old school games. And they've been releasing a lot of PSP games that are just rehashes or remixes or 
you know, uh, just re-releases of older games. Like, there's some Castlevania action on there, and there's some Mega Man action on there. Well, they must have seen how well Nintendo's doing by selling Mario 1 to me again. <laughs> uh, Plus, imagine this, and uh, this is total speculation. I don't think Nintendo will actually do it, because we all know that Nintendo only does things if they make a lot of money off of it. But imagine if Nintendo coupled the fact that the Wii can download stuff with the DS, and say you could pay to get... I don't know, Mario 1 in your Wii, and then you can do the download demo play and get Mario 1 in your DS until you turn it off, like they do with demos now. Mm -hmm. That would be an absolutely killer app for a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. But uh, I think what's happening with the PSP is the same thing that we're seeing on the Wii, and the same thing we kind of saw on the DS, is that... The game development industry is becoming ridiculously risk-averse. They don't want to take any risks, especially since it costs way too much to develop a game. Even a DS game costs a reasonable amount of money to develop, even if you don't have to pay Nintendo a lot of money. Yeah, and a so, few people took a bath on the end gauge. Yeah, so no one wants to develop a game and have it be for a system that isn't going to sell or make a game that has no chance of selling. So when a system is new, no matter what system it is, Nobody wants to make a game for it that cost any amount of money. They'll make a cheap game for it, which is why the PSP came out and there were just crap games. The DS came out, there's tech demos. We came out, just tech demos. It's because no one wants to pay, you know, and make a huge investment and develop a real game for a system that just came out or isn't even out yet. You have no idea how well that system's going to do. So I think from here on out, unless suddenly games become cheaper, easier to develop... Or, you know, people stop buying games that cost so much to develop. And maybe game developers and publishers want to take some risks. You're always going to see a new console come out, no matter what console it is. Not have any games for it for quite a while. And unless a lot of people buy the console and buy the tech demos for it, uh, then, and only then, will you actually see the real games come out. But then, if consumers are smart, you have this chicken-egg scenario where... I won't buy a PS3 until there's good games for the PS3. And the developers won't make good games for the PS3 until I buy a PS3. Exactly. And the only way this cycle of doom is going to stop is either if we keep buying consoles that don't have good games for them, publishers decide to take some risks, games become cheaper to develop, or I don't know. I think in the immediate term, this is actually slightly beneficial to gamers. And this is some roundabout logic here. But think of this. The only people who buy a console at launch are the people who are hardcore about gaming in some or way. Or eBay. Yes. Well, but the PS3 was mostly eBay, as yes. we learned. But for the DS, I mean, the average gamer wasn't just going to buy a DS on opening day because there was nothing for it. Nothing at all. But people like me and Scott, when I bought the DS, to me, I was voting with my dollars. I was saying, I'm going to put forth X money because I believe that X money is worth faith that this console is going to be worth it to me someday. And by buying it now, I am giving it my vote. And I think, at least aside from the PS3, people who buy a console ahead of time like that are voting for that console and all the potential of that console, whether they realize it or not. Now, the PS2 didn't have to worry about that because the PS2 had so much momentum from the PS1 that developers just jumped on it immediately because it was a sure thing. Yeah, the thing is, with this voting, is that it's not free voting. It's one thing if you go to the election booth and you vote for someone for president and they don't oh, win. Oh, I agree. It's definitely a If you a go and you vote with $600 and then you lose, you just lost $600. You got nothing for it. Yes, hence the only people who vote are people who are rich, confident, or stupid. Uh, oh, well. Maybe one day uh, our uh, answers will come. Yep. Though I also think Nintendo is one of the few companies that has the really, really prime position to take this cycle and break it with consoles if they were just hit with more first-party games early on. I also think another good solution, which is sort of falls into the lower your development cost solution, is when you make a game, make the game, and then just make more of the game. You don't need... Everyone freaking updates their engine and adds the graphics and everything. Just make 10 more levels and put out the same game again. We don't care. If your game was good, we want more. It's like, look at, like, Half-Life 2. They just made more levels. I bought it. You know, what, what other games did that? DDR. They just make more songs. We buy it. Yep, Guitar Heroes definitely has that infinite product cycle of constantly buying new versions because there's always something new, and you don't have to do anything to the game because the game already exists. 
Yeah, make you re-release old games <laughs> that people can't find anymore. Yeah, of take course. games that are already made in other countries and are already profitable. Just translate them and sell them. With Nintendo, I see. I mean, with the GameCube, they hit us right away with Smash Brothers Melee, which effectively the GameCube was a Smash Brothers Melee machine for a long time after most people bought it. Mm. And I think that that drove a lot of sales. The first party games that hit right away. I think they hit right away because the GameCube wasn't really positioned very well, especially after the N64. That is something else, is that the GameCube, while it hit pretty poorly, it did hit with, like, two first-party games. The Luigi's Mansion, which wasn't so good, but it was still a first-party game that people hadn't played, and the Smash Brothers. And then a little while later came the Metroid Prime. So it was really three first-party games right away. The Wii still has... Really only one. I don't even want to count anything other than Zelda. Yeah, but I'd wager... Excite Truck's okay. The reason that it's different here, because Nintendo could have hit with the Wii, and they might have even been planning to, but notice how they pushed off some dates for games and things. Yep. I think that because the Wii is still selling solely on the virtue of Wii Sports, and the fact that it's a Wii... Oh yeah, Wii Sports. I mean, Wii Sports single-handedly is selling, I'd say currently, if not the majority, at least a significant percentage of the Wii... Probably all of them. Yeah, well, because all the gamers who bought one already bought one, but yeah. all the grandmas who want to bowl and play tennis, they're selling like hotcakes. Nintendo, it's basically a bowling and tennis machine as far as they're concerned. They're never going to buy another game for it. So I've said this before, but Nintendo's going to wait, and I'll bet pretty much as we sell Slack, the pressure they put to make first-party games come out is going to increase directly proportional. Uh, well, Super Paper Mario comes out, I think, next week. So. I'm excited about Super Paper Mario because while I've I still I've have seen... to pre-order it on Amazon. <laughs> Ah, uh, you better get to that. I think I will. I got, I'll get to pre-order all the video games, actually, probably this weekend. I don't know. Ever since I started playing some Smash Brothers Melee again recently, I'm feeling the new Smash Brothers real hardcore. It's not gonna... They haven't dated that or showed us anything other than Solid Snake. Oh, no, no, no. But I'll, I'm more excited about this game than I've been about any game since Twilight Princess. Eh. Eh. Sorry. Well, not counting PC games. But... Things of the day. So Scott and Alex had both been, well, Scott more so than anyone, been on this tower defense game kick for a while. Yeah, I played pretty much every free tower defense game on the internets. I resisted this mostly due to the fact that every tower defense game I saw sucked ass. Well, some of them were good. Some of them were better than others. Some of them did suck ass. In general, it's sort of one of those game genres where it's either playable or unplayable. Yeah. Well, plus, I don't really have time to play Flash games at work like I might have at other jobs I've had, so I really just didn't play them. But Alex started getting into them, and we started playing this one in the living room, and what was originally going to be a German board gaming night ended up with us sitting there for like an hour or two, each of us on a computer in the same room, not talking, playing the stupid tower defense game. This one is actually a lot better than a lot of the others, because in other tower defense games, generally... There's a path that the enemies follow, and at one end they come in, the other end they come out, and you put your towers in between the path and try to position them to do the most damage to the bad guys as they fo- go along their merry way. And yes. don't let them, you want to kill them before they get off the map. Now, you see, the basic idea of a tower defense game is kind of a genre of gaming, is you've got a thing and you want to protect it from other things that are coming to get it. Yes, you allocate resources into damage-dealing things and then position them so that you get the most out of them. And therefore, you most you try to spend your resources to most efficiently get as much damage as possible. Well, this game called Desktop Tower Defense probably is the best tower defense game out there. And if anyone knows of one better, I implore you to share it with everyone in the forums. This game has enough variety in enemies and in structures to keep you interested pretty much the whole way through. Yep. It has a very unique setup where you build your structures, and not only do the structures attack the enemies in different ways, but the structures themselves form the path that the enemies follow. Yes, if you don't, if you just build your structures like in the middle of the map, all the bad guys that come from the top will go straight to the bottom and leave, and all the bad guys that come in from the left will go straight to the right and leave. But if you build your towers, like, to make walls, you can never block it off. So you can never trap the bad guys so they can't get off the map, because that would just be stupid. But what you can do is you can make a maze. You can use your towers, which deal damage, and position them such that they make a maze, and the enemies have to go in between the towers. And you can give them a very long path to follow before they make it to the other end of the map and are able to escape. 
Now, we've all beaten level 50 pretty handily after playing this game a little bit, and I think you'll be able to do well at it too. Though I'll warn you, it is difficult, and you're going to have some trouble early on until you figure out a cue, a cue, a few key ideas like maybe you should take a narrow path for your guys to follow. Maybe you should try to funnel all the guys coming in into one spot and then have them go off together so you can maximize firepower. Huh, that one structure seems to damage things adjacent to it. Maybe I should increase its surface area. Yeah, all kinds of stuff like that. It, it's pretty good. There's a, it, I think the one thing that's about it that is the best is that in other tower defense games, generally, some towers are just better than others. And it's a matter of, do I build, which tower do you build? And are you going to build more towers or are you just going to upgrade a few towers? In this one, you kind of have to buy the cheap tower a lot, even though it sucks, relatively speaking, because, well... You it, you have to build walls, and there's no other way to build enough towers to make a maze other than using a lot of the cheap tower. And it, it's kind of annoying. I just want to build a big tower. But no, you can't. I got to build a small tower. Yep. Many, many times. And you find yourself making your thing pretty much out of these cheap pellet towers. And you can also... Then you'll augment that by putting special towers in key locations. Everything's upgradable. You can sell stuff. There's different kind of yeah, enemies. Yeah, and every tower defense scheme, there's always been the option to sell. This is the first time I've actually used it. Because I'll basically build a maze with the shitty pellet towers. And then, you know, that'll hold me out. And I'll be able to get more money. And then I'll sell pellet towers and put better ones in their place. <laughs> All right, so you know those bio tapestries b-a-y-e-u-x yes yes i do it's the real it's a really long and narrow tapestry that shows the uh, norman invasion of england dodongo disliketh smoke yep those the, the saxons same. disliketh normans exactly the, that same tapestry well some guy decided he was going to make something in the vein of that tapestry involving of course super mario of course of course so he made this really long image. It's like a few, I guess if you printed it out, it'd be a few feet long. And it, as you scroll to the right, it plays out uh, a fucked up version <laughs> of level 1-1 in Super Mario Brothers. It reminds me a lot of various walk down the street and fight games. Like yeah. the aesthetic is definitely there. You know, you're Hagar and you're punching guys and hammer locking them and killing them as you walk. Yeah, it also reminds me sort of of a uh, Chromati. Plus a uh, communist Mario sort of thing. Hagar and Freddy are kind of similar. Yeah, yeah, they are. And uh, I'll just say that when you finally scroll to the very, very right end of this tapestry, if you will, there is a joke waiting for you. So make sure you start on the way left and scroll to the right very slowly. Scott very pointedly took control of the mouse and showed it, really revealed it to me bit by bit, much the way you'd reveal a Newman. Yeah, if you view this as just one large image on some tremendously, tremendous widescreen monitor or many monitors side by side and have a really wide browser window, you'll lose the whole effect. Dude, if you have a monitor and a resolution such that you see this entire thing at once without having to do anything... Without having to zoom out. My head is off to you, good sir. <laughs> it's pretty long. So, we've talked about a lot of different games lately, and one thing we haven't talked about are PC games. Well, I think that's partially because a lot of the PC games that we really like are old and dead, and we all run Linux, so we're not playing new PC games, and our PCs suck, so we're not playing new PC games. Yes, well, particularly And PC gaming is PC. dying or dead. Yes, as is evidenced by the fact that Walmart is all but eliminating their PC game section in several of their stores. Hell, if you went to an EB a few years ago, the PC section is like one shelf. Yeah. Last time I went to an EB in New York City, the only PC games they had were in this bin for five bucks. I went over there, but there was nothing worth five bucks. Well, if you go to the GameStop uh, that w that's near us, there's like, you know, the GameCube section, the DS section, the Wii section, a giant PS2 section, a giant Xbox 360 section. They take up like big chunks of the wall of the store. The PC games take up one freestanding wheelie shelf in the middle of this. Man, I remember a day when if I went to an EB, they sold nothing but computer games. Pretty much, yeah. And if I wanted a non-computer game, I had to go to Toys R Us to buy a Nintendo game. Yeah, they used to be you had to go to like software, etc. to get computer games. And the PC games and the 
console games were sold in completely different places. Yep, I remember. Well, think about this. There were stores dedicated to selling PC games. Yeah, because PC games were considered software, and console games are considered toys. I would go to Babbage's and pay 15 bucks more than I should have to get a PC game. And it would be on the sh same shelf as a C++ compiler from Borland. <laughs> ah, at, at <laughs> software, etc. I just had a bunch of memories of when I was young, wondering what the hell a compiler was, and why I would want one, and why that box was so expensive. I have a $90 C++ compiler that for Windows 3.1. That uh, is on like 14 floppy disks. I also remember owning more PC games than I had hard drive space and having to rotate games in and out depending on what mood I was in. Anyway, Wesnoth is an interesting PC game because number one, it works no matter what your OS. So Windows, Mac, Linux, you can play this game. Dude, you can play this on NetBSD, OpenBSD, Solaris, Risk OS, the GP2X, uh, Windows, BOS, all right, and all right. Amiga OS 4. Also, it doesn't require a whole lot of system resources. You can play this without a 3D card just fine. If you've got a computer with a screen and a mouse and a keyboard and a modern CPU, I guess, you could probably play this on a Pentium 3 if you wanted to. Probably handily. Yeah, uh, you can play this game. And thirdly, this game is free. As in all types of free. It is free as in beer, free as in speech, free as in free, free, free. It costs nothing to play. You can edit it. You can do whatever you want. So, The Battle for Wesnoth is a game designed by a man named David White. He made it in, uh, I think, 2003 he started it. And he's now the lead developer for the project. I'm obviously semi-quoting Wikipedia. Dun-dun-dun. And it's based very heavily on uh, several of those old Sega Genesis turn-based strategy games. Yes, this is a turn-based strategy game. You have a hex map, and you have units on the hex map. And you click on them, and you move them, and then if they end up next to a bad guy, you tell them to attack, and they do some damage. Now, I have a dark secret to reveal that despite all of my PC gaming, and I had Command and & Conquer and Red Alert and Warcraft and all these games, mm -hmm. and XCOM and everything, I've always hated RTSs. Like, really. I well, just, the I, thing is, I liked Warcraft 1 just because it was a fun game. In, in those days, I wasn't really thinking yeah, about it. I, I, put I also like Command & Conquer for the same reason. Let me put it this way. I liked Warcraft 1, and I liked Command & Conquer 1. But, Warcraft 2 also. But I didn't enjoy them as much as I could because I spent half the game going, wow, this is really neat, and half the game going, god damn it, get out of the way of the tank. What? Ah, ah. Yes, I think over time, the frustrations with the RTS genre and the lack of change in it frustrated me enough that it was no longer fun. Like, when it, I, Warcraft 1 was a new idea. Like, when I saw Warcraft 1, I was like, what the hell kind of game is this? And the RTS was new and exciting. And it was pretty much Warcraft 1, Warcraft 2, Command & Conquer, Command & Conquer Red Alert. Those were the four RTSs. I guess Total Annihilation is, you know, I never... Total Annihilation is in a class all unto yes, itself. Yes, I never played it enough, but I have a hard time disagreeing that it is, like, the RTS of RTSs. And maybe Supreme Commander, I don't know if I can say about that yet. But Yeah, I've heard good buzz on the internet, but the only people who can play Supreme Commander are, people with $5, are, computers. are like the hardest of core PC gamers. And if you're a hardcore PC gamer, that's like being a hardcore Cubs fan. Yep. And while Warcraft 3 and StarCraft and those sorts of, you know, and the newer Command & Conquers were probably technically better RTSs, they weren't really fun for me. Like, even StarCraft, which everyone loves, it's, it's not fun for me because... It comes down to just being annoying. I mean, it's click on, know what buildings to build in the right order, and know how many units to build. Yeah, real-time strategy games are barely... Well, one, they're almost not about tactics at all, or even about strategy Yeah, in it's general. like you eventually... I mean, I watched my brother play Warcraft 3, because he didn't play too many RTSs in his childhood, so he got Warcraft 3 when he was into PC gaming, and all he would do was know what order to build the buildings in, have the hero walk around the board getting levels. Then he would eventually get like a supreme unit, build as many as he could, select them all, and click on the enemy base. And that was it. And yep. I, I used to play a lot of Command & Conquer online with a lot of people, with my modem, and then my cable modem back in the day. And there was all those gaming networks. But I constantly got my ass kicked when I played against human beings who weren't my friends who lived in the neighborhood who played the same way I did. And I always would build units. Like I'd build a squadron of tanks. And then I'd send it off to a corner of the map and have him wait there while I built another group of units and put somewhere else. And I try to coordinate like pincer attacks and ambushes. And None I, of that stuff matters. I tried to have strategy. And one day, one of my friends who was good at the game, who I'd never really played against, I asked him if I could just watch him play online because he always won. And all he did was 
build the tank producing buildings, build a billion tanks, select them all, click on the enemy base, wait. Yeah. And, and I was like, what the, ah, oh, that's how you win? And he's like, yeah, what were you doing? Trying to build a wall? Yeah, they put, like, Command and Conquer Red Alert had walls, cement walls, barbed wire walls, landmines. All that stuff was useless. Yeah, pretty the much. The only strategy was if you're the Soviets, build as many tanks as you can and click on the enemy base. Much like the actual Soviet military doctrine. <laughs> yes, it was quite accurate. Anyway, this is why, regardless of accuracy or realism or anything else, turn-based strategy games are fun because... This strategy. You get to do whatever you want on your turn. You have time to think about it. You, you could act, There's actually... It matters what you make and where you move it to. You can look at numbers and figure out, you know, how much damage is going to be done. There's terrain that matters. And when you're done, you push end my turn, and then the other person goes. And they take their turn, because it's turn-based and not real time. Yep. Now, a bunch of other turn-based games I would definitely recommend. Advance Wars? A any Advance Wars game, especially Advance Wars 2 for the Game Boy Advance and XCOM. XCOM is very good. If you're hardcore, I'd recommend this game called Gemfire for the SNES, but I'll I don't warn think you, anyone's going to be playing Gemfire. Gemfire is a badass freaking game and you can die in a fire. Fantasy Empires if you count that. Fantasy Empires is turn-based and real time. Is it turn? I didn't know it was real time at the all. The combat itself is real time. Oh right! But it's statistically based, and it's not—it's not really real time. It's basically—it's real time that doesn't pretend to have all this strategy. Basically, all your units will be AI, and they'll charge, and all the enemy's units will be AI, and they'll charge, and it, all it comes down to is statistically which army was better, and the one guy you were controlling, you could do something specific like. Run over and smash up the enemy's Cast walls. Cast a spell. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's really a special case. But all those things aside, for the PC right now, I would say that Wesnoth is the premier RTS, if not one of, not RTS, turn-based game, if not one of the top ten. Yeah, it, Civilization doesn't count because that's not like a strategy war game. That's a strategy Civilization game. It's different. Yes. Now, Wesnoth is not a deterministic game. Advance Wars is, for the most part, a deterministic yes, game. Yes, in Advance Wars, it's deterministic. That means if uh, you have an infantry, you know, from this CO and an infantry from that CO, and they're both standing on planes and they shoot each other, this and this guy is the attacker and that guy's the defender, every single time, the same amount of damage will be done, pretty much, like... 90% of the time, there's like so little difference in how much damage is done that it doesn't matter. I mean, I can know playing against Scott that if I'm grit and I've got an artillery and I shoot it at his tank and it's in this terrain and it's this damage. And I he's do, in this terrain. I will do X damage to it and I can plan accordingly and so can Scott. Yes. In Wesnoth, it is not as deterministic. If yes. I have a, uh, a foot pad and he attacks a bat, He'll do pretty much almost the same amount of damage each time, but he it's sort of like D&D &D where it's like you might miss. Is it, he might miss. Sometimes they do. They just go miss, miss, miss. Sometimes he'll hit, hit, hit and kill the bat right away, and sometimes he'll do some in between. There is sort of this randomness in the game. They, it's like the game's rolling dice for you where you can't see. Yes, but the, the key thing here, now we're not going to go into a whole debate of deterministic versus random games, yes. because I think that both methods have very much merit, they and do. it really depends on what you're going for, yep. and you can't say that one is better than the other, and I, I strongly disagree with people who do. A lot of people do, in fact, there are a lot of people who have forked Wesnoth and made deterministic versions, and there's a bunch of them, and they're all pretty bad. Uh, yeah, notice how the, uh, if any of the deterministic versions were any good then the actual Wesnoth probably would have inherited those deterministic traits, and it hasn't, therefore. Yes. <laughs> obviously, those deterministic games are no good. But a common pitfall of random damage games, or any game where there's a lot of randomness, or things are determined randomly like this, is that if you don't have enough of the randomness, if you don't have enough instances where randomness is a factor, randomness can affect the game more readily, because there's less time for it to even out. Mm. I think uh, Battle Lore is a good example of a game where, while it can be fun, I'm not going to mm. argue about this, <laughs> the randomness is concentrated to the point that one short run of bad luck can make you lose a battle wholly and immediately. Well, in Wesnoth, there is enough testing of randomness to where overall it would take one freaking bad run for you to lose solely on randomness. Well, I think the, the thing in Wesnoth is that randomness, while it's there, it serves two purposes. 
And the first purpose is that it makes the game very simple. Part of the goal of Wesnoth is to have a turn-based war game that is simple, that anyone can play and not have to be a hardcore war master. Yes, yet at the same time, he very much wanted a simple game that is not trivial. A game that still has great tactical and strategic depth, but yet doesn't force you to do mundane calculations. Yes, the other part of the, the advantage of the randomness is that it, it, it removes any paralysis, analysis paralysis. If there was... If it was deterministic game it's a hex map with a whole bunch of different units and a whole bunch of factors you'd be sitting there exactly calculating everything with the randomness it encourages you to just take your goddamn turn because and you just you just kind of go with it you know? yep and also uh one big thing about war games that i have a love-hate relationship with is that actual real warfare if you study history I mean, most people would say, yeah, in a video game, you want it to be 100% deterministic, or even if it's random, you want skill to no matter what. If you send a better unit against a weaker unit, you'd think that the weaker unit should always die no matter what. But actual warfare relies a lot more on luck, happenstance, and just dumb... Circumstance. Luck, yes. Than it ever Sparta. has. <laughs> okay. I mean, battles turn on the fact that, oh shit, it rained one day. Or, oh no, Hitler was asleep and they didn't send the troops out in time. <laughs> Things like that. Yep. So, a, real, a realistic war game has a lot more randomness than a pure gamer might like. So, a balanced war game that is based on randomness at all, or has randomness in it, you have to straddle that fine line between having someone to, you know, you have to make the decision of, my cavalry might not come back if I send them into that plane. Yep. The last comment I want to make about the randomness in Wesnoth is that it definitely adds some drama in the game. Where yes. Sometimes, you know, if, if the stronger unit always won and it was deterministic, when you send a guy out to fight, it's not exciting. And it, it would actually make the game less fun if, you know, aha, my giant troll smashes your puny zombie, right? But... If it's sort of random, sometimes, like, a guy with a sword will go and cut up a really strong bad guy and do a lot of damage. And now that guy has to run away, and it's like, ha-ha, look at that, oh yeah. And sometimes, you know, it'll be random, and a guy will go up and attack, and it won't do anything. And you'll be like, oh shit, because now your guy is standing there out in the middle of the war zone, and he didn't do any damage, and there's a really strong, pissed-off guy right next to him. And you're yep. like... Uh. I'll be watching like my last holdout standing in the elven fortress and Scott zombies are surrounding it. And I'm just, come on, man, just hold out one more round. Just hold out. Just hold out. Yeah. Well, if you haven't gathered, Wesnoth has a fantasy theme. It's not outer space. It's not uh, real military guys. It's wizards and goblins and all that shit. And there are basically six different races you can choose to play as. Yeah, in the normal default game. Because, one, remember, this is open source. So the game is entirely extensible. And people can There's do... actually a, a Wesnoth programming language. You can make campaigns and you can pretty much make anything for Wesnoth in this language. There's also a very active community around this game. And if you go into the Wesnoth forums, there are a lot of people who would love for you to commit to add things to this game, to submit comments, critiques, to make art for it, music, anything. Thing. Yep. Well, the six races are the rebels, who are basically the elves. Yes. The elves, they have lots of elves on their team, and they're very really good in the trees. When an elf is in a tree, he's pretty dangerous, and when he's out not in a tree, he's pretty weak. They also have Ents on the elven team, which are, when they're in the trees, you can't even see them. And then they pop out of the trees, and they're really big, and they do a lot of damage, because, well, they're trees that now, walk. Now, this is another key factor in what I think makes Wesnoth great. Now, look at a game like Advance Wars. And it's largely symmetric in that any two forces that are fighting will be similar. Like, every force has anti-aircraft. Oh, yeah, everyone pretty much has the same units in Advance Wars. Everyone has infantry, mech, small tank, medium tank, neo tank, mega tank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, there might be variances like, this guy's artillery are more powerful, or this guy's infantry are weak. Yes, but, but the other people still have infantry, and it's they still, still have artillery. It's still largely symmetric. That both sides are generally equal or generally similar. Wesnoth is very asymmetric. Each of these factions or races or whatever you want to call them have completely different sets of units and types of units. Some are have a lot of artillery, not artillery, but a lot of cavalry and you know, foot soldiers, while other ones have a lot of flying dragons. It's a lot more like StarCraft, where the Zergs and what the humans, the Terrans, I think. And what's the third one? 
Well, I don't remember, but th- there's three completely different races. You know, one of them is a few expensive, really strong guys, and the other ones are really good at the nighttime. And there's lots of undead bat. There's like weak flying guys and strong ground guys. Another one has lots of guys with ranged attacks. You know, they're all completely different. Yeah, just, just so there's basically dragons, undead. Uh, looks like orcs and trolls, humans, dwarves, elves. The dwarves have this one really interesting unit I want to mention called the Ulf Serker. And he he's really cool because the way he works is when most units in this game have an attack such as like 3-5. Three 3-5 five. Three five means when they fight, they try to hit three times. And if they do hit, they'll do five damage, right? Now this harkens this idea all the way back to a bunch of old RTSs, especially on Sega systems. Yes. Well, and I, I keep saying RTSs, turn-based games. Yes. Because uh, TTS just doesn't feel so good. Or no, it TBS doesn't. or yeah. whatever you want to. But-, but the Ulf Serker guy, anyway, he will not stop attacking. <laughs> he just keeps attacking until either he kills the other guy or he dies. Well, what I was going to say before you continued was that a lot of these turn-based games... In order to prevent the game bogging down into once two units meet, they fight until one of them dies, they'd often have an idea where when two units fight, there's a set number of turns or a set number of actions. Like, I'll get to attack twice and he'll get to attack twice. And then combat stops until the next turn. This game does that in terms of any unit can attack X number of times for X number of damage and counterattack X number of times for X number of damage. Yep. So, yeah. Now, it's, also, it's pretty in, cool. instead of artillery or long-range attacks. There's no such thing as that. Instead, it breaks it up in terms of normal melee combat, but based on type. So if I attack a unit with uh, archery or ranged attacks, then it can only respond with ranged attacks. Yeah, there's no ranged attacks from multiple hexes away. So, like, if you're three hexes away from me, I can't shoot you with my arrows. You always have to be adjacent to whoever you're fighting. And But the thing is, if I use arrows on you, then... If you don't have a ranged attack, I, you're pretty much, I shoot at you and you don't shoot at me at all. I don't take any damage. You don't even have a chance to damage me. But then if you go into melee with me, I can go into melee with you if I have a melee attack. So usually when you fight, there's counterattacking. Like hit, 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 hit in both directions. Yes. Now also, aside from being ranged or whatever, there's a lot of different kinds of attacking. There's, you know, blade weapon attacks, piercing weapon attacks. Yeah, there's like slash, pierce, bludgeon, magic uh, all kinds of yes, stuff. Yes, fire, cold. And it comes down to there's a lot of strategic depth here. But again, because it's asymmetric and you'll only have a subset of the total kinds of units, there's not so much information for you to manage. And it's all really straightforward. Piercing weapons don't work so well against skeletons because the arrows would just go right through them and the spears just go right through them. Yeah, you want to use some bludgeons on those Yes, skeletons. but hammers or magic take them right out. Yep. Or a spear or something like that does a whole ton of damage against a cavalry unit. And this is where the strategy comes in, is let's say the other guy has, he's the elves, and he has the big trees, right? So you get some mages who shoot fire to go out and burn the trees down. But those mages are pretty weak, and if some elves with swords come along, especially in the woods, they're just going to chop up your mages, and it's not going to work. So you have to sort of build the correct numbers of units and send them out in a well-arranged group and, like, just the right hexes. So that, you know, the enemy can't get your guys and you can get your guys that are strong against them in the correct groupings. Now, in addition... the grouping switch, you're going to lose. In addition to that, there is a continuous passage of time. And it'll oscillate between day and night, slowly, turn by turn. Yeah, like every three or four turns, it'll change from day to night. And there's there's dusk, day, dawn, all those things. And some units fight better at night. Some fight okay all the time. Some fight better during the day. Yeah, so generally, if you're the undead, right, at night, you're going to be on the offensive because you're way stronger than your opponent, unless your opponent is also the undead, in which case it doesn't matter. And during the day, you might actually run away if you're the undead because you're really weak. (laughs) But yet some factions will have neutral guys who aren't affected by day and night and lawful or and chaotic, chaotic being the ones who are better at night. And lawful being the ones who are better during the day. Yeah, so there's actually, you know, every few turns, sort of the tide of the game has to change. and You have to mix up your guys accordingly. Now, along with one other important tactical consideration, which is terrain, which basically summed up terrain matters an incredible amount in this game. Yeah, it's like a dwarf in the mountains will fuck you up. An elf in the forest is like twice as powerful. Yep, a merman in the water, you've got no chance. But a merman on the land, what's he doing there? (laughs) Yeah, he's pretty much just gonna die. Yeah, the mermen are pretty cool. I like mermen. Yeah. Now, all of these factors combined 
make it so where the game has a very dynamic feel. Now look at Advance Wars, a deterministic game, where in order to reduce analysis paralysis and all the problems inherent in deterministic games, they basically had to make the game incredibly simple and make the maps very small, and terrain matters, but not nearly as much as it does in Wesnoth. Wesnoth, because the maps tend to be much larger, and Wesnoth works even on gigantic maps, depending on how you set it up. As long as you have enough players. Yeah. But the game is such that it's very dynamic, and strategies can very much be along the lines of, I want to send a scouting party to the south to secure all those villages, while I muster troops in the north and send them along a line to secure the front along the water. I'm then going to wait overnight in this strong defensive position, because I'm lawful, and then once dawn breaks, I'm going to rush over the water and attack the undead. Yeah, there's a lot of... You have to keep changing what you're doing. There's no, like, one straightforward way to win in Wesnot. Yeah, if you, you just build a bunch of units... It's not like StarCraft, where you can just build your strongest unit as many times as you can, and then send them over to the enemy's base and win. This, That's not gonna work. This is where Wesnot shines. It's one of those rare games, but well, one of those rare any kind of combat games with strategy and tactics, where you have to consider the situation... And where retreating is not only often prudent, but retreating will often win you a battle. An orderly retreat, regroup, and counterattack is a very valid and important tactic. Yeah, I think the reason that is is because generally, you, if you're attacking with a like a homogenous you know group where a lot of the units are the same type, it's going to be real weak because the other guy's just going to send the the type of unit that destroys your guys over there. So you generally want to mix it up and. The problem is, is some units are fast and some are slow. So some of them you send out into the battlefield and the other ones still need to catch up. And then night will come or day will come and now your guys are weak. So you retreat a little bit. It allows some guys to catch up. It allows some other guys to fall back and not get killed. Then the, the day changes again. Now you've got this nice little army all grouped up, grouped up, full of all the different types of units. You can move it forward, take back the territory you just retreated from and take some more. Yep. There's also the fact that you can only generate, generally, units with your leader. Every side of it has a leader, and you lose if your leader gets killed. If the leader is in a keep, he can recruit units. Yeah. And you can only generally, I mean, you can theoretically move your leader to any keep and recruit units there. But a lot of maps will only have two. One where you are, one where your enemy is. Yep, or one for each guy. So if there's four players, there'll be four keeps. So as a result... The further you spread out, or the more you're on the offensive, the longer your supply chains are, the longer it takes units to get to back up your troops, or to make a fallback line. Yeah, the only way to solve that problem is to make a giant army, and then move your leader out into the field, and bring him to the enemy's keep, win, take that keep, and use that one. But, while you're making this giant army, depending on how you're playing, because you may or may not have fog of war and shrouds and all sorts of things, where you yep. can or cannot see what's going on, Maybe the enemy has a scout up there, or you can just see, and he watches the army you are building, and he just makes at his leisure a defensive army ready to hold out yep, against plus, that army. Plus, as soon as your leader is out of your keep, you can't make any more units, and he's still making them while you're walking over there. Yes. <laughs> now, also, units generally don't heal on their own. You either need to send units that can heal other units by being adjacent, grab your guys into towns, hold them behind the lines and let them rest not moving for a while, or build new units. Yeah. Or level them up. Yes. Now, this is a game mechanic that I've seen in a few games, but the first time I ever saw it was in a game for the Sega Game Gear called Crystal Warriors. Well, the first time I saw it was actually, at least in a strategy game, was Warcraft 3. Well, I guess Civ really? 2, maybe? Crystal fucking well, wh Warriors for the Game Gear. Yeah? Yeah, basically, the idea is units have experience points. And you get like Fire Emblem. You get experience points every time your unit survives combat, regardless of whether or not he started it. You also get a ton of experience points if you take out an enemy unit. Yes. The, now, here's where the strategy comes in. Let's say there's a unit that is worth a lot of experience points. You've got one guy on the cusp of leveling, and you've got another guy who's actually really strong against that type of unit who's not on the cusp of leveling. So you have the guy who's really strong attack... And he doesn't kill it, but he brings it real low. Then your guy in the cusp of leveling deals the final blow and gets all the XP and levels up. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. One, any time a unit levels up, it gets full health back. And this is a strategy in Crystal Warriors back in the day I used all the time, where I use a unit and I use a unit, and he's on the verge of death, or I plan it to where right as he's near death, he's going to level up and get all his life back. Another thing I'll do is I'll take a unit, and I'll try to get it experience, and then heal it, 
and if it's close to leveling and I'll heal it just enough so that it won't die, I'll put it out in a dangerous position just to tempt the other guy into attacking it and making it level up. Or if you've got a unit that's close to leveling but is also close to dead, you bring it back behind your lines and heal it just to make sure it doesn't die and then send it back. The game rewards you for trying to keep units alive and retreating as opposed to just sending units off willy-nilly yeah. to die. Also, when guys level up, they become real dangerous. Yes, every unit has a leveling tree of some kind where some units just get more powerful. Some units, like say you've got uh, a cavalry guy and he has a sword and he levels up. Now you can choose if you want a knight who has X hit points and has a lance that does a bunch of charging damage but also has a sword or a lancer who has a crazy lance attack but no sword attack and he moves further but he has less hit points. Yeah, and depending on which one of those you choose, that will determine their future upgrading if they ever get to level 3 or 4 or 5 or any other level. Yes, so generally you're rewarded by having units that survive a long time. So you're rewarded by playing the game like an actual person in battle and tending to wounded units and having a primary line and a secondary line the other and all that sort of stuff. The other reason that saving units from death is really important is because the way the resources work. In Wesnoth, there's pretty much one resource, gold. You start with an amount of gold and you get a base income of a certain amount of gold a turn, usually not very much. For every unit you have on the board, you ha if you have too many, uh, then you have to start paying money to support them, sort of an upkeep, if you will. And there are cities on the board. Now, if you send a guy into a city, then you put a little flag in that city that has your color on it. That city gives you a certain amount of money each turn, and it helps you out with your upkeep action. Yep. See, units cost upkeep, and yep. it's per level, so higher level units cost even more upkeep. Yep. So what you're trying to do is, in addition to building units and destroying the other guy, you're trying to basically touch all these cities to get flags in them, to increase your income, to make it so you can build units faster. Yep. Also, cities are highly defensible and heal. Yep. So it's sort of like you can't just march and... Uh, an army straight towards the enemy base. You need to go around collecting cities and making sure the other guy doesn't sneak around stealing them back from you. Because all you need to do to take a city is make a guy move into it. And a lot of you know, the races you can choose, like the undead have these flying bats. They're real weak, relatively cheap. They can fly real far and real fast. If you don't kill the bats, if a guy builds like four bats, he can fly them around the map and just take all the cities in like two turns. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Effectively, in the end, the game, no matter how you're playing it, rewards actual tactical and strategic play to the point that you get a dynamic, ever-changing, awesome experience just about every time you play. It's also simple enough that you don't have to be a war genius to figure it out. You might need to be smarter than the person you're playing against to win often, but you're going to have fun regardless. And there's yes. some easy single-player games that you can play and... It's real easy to set this game up for all sorts of multiplayer. Yes, now let's talk about the different modes of play a bit. Because the game comes with a bunch of single-player, straight-up, story-based campaigns that are mostly awesome. I highly recommend, if you're picking this game up for the first time, that you try the South Guard and pick whatever difficulty level you deem appropriate to your level of intelligence. There's also a one really, really easy campaign. I don't know the name of it, but basically it's like four missions and you just chase an evil wizard around to like four different maps. But it's real fun because it's so easy. Yes. Now, the single player regardless of anything else, is fun. And you can just play it like a straight-up game. Yep. If I had bought this game and it had these campaigns in it, I probably would have felt okay with it because they're the stories are pretty good. Yep. The scenarios are interesting. The, some of them are very interesting. And the game is so extensible that there's one in one campaign where it even tells you you can't win. All you are doing is holding the line. You have a bunch of units, and your goal is to hold off the undead scourge as long as you can, dying to the last ban. And depending on how long you hold out, more troops or less troops are mustered at the actual castle where you make your real last stand. Ah, a lot see, of fun stuff. That like shows that. you how powerful the Wesnoth language is and that you can make a campaign like that. You know, that it even allows for that sort of craziness to go on. But yeah, there's um, in addition to all those cool single player campaigns, you can just play a multiplayer game against AI. Yep. And the AI in this game is not the best AI in the world. But it's pretty smart. It, it'll it can beat you. Yeah. I spent, like we tried. We thought, oh, the AI is dumb, and we played against it with like by giving it more resources than we had because like we're smarter than the AI. We'll give it more resources, 
and it just kicked our asses. So we played it with even resources, and it was a semi-even game. We still won, but it was just pretty even. Yeah, I mean, compared to Advanced Wars AI, this game is a thousand times better AI. Yeah, I think that's part of the goal of the Wesnoth Project, actually, is to have AI that's kind of smart. And yes. they have succeeded in doing that. Now, in terms of multiplayer, you can play on official Wesnoth servers. You can run your own server. You can run your client and have other people connect to your client. Yeah, it pretty much allows for every sort of multiplayer connection. You, you can know? do hot seat where everyone just shares one PC and it dings when it's your turn. Yeah, it, it, it lets you do just about everything. You, know? you can you, customize, pick whatever map, make your own maps, make whatever rules you want for random any multiplayer. Maps, random maps. You could, you could decide uh, random races or pick your races or... You know, one guy starts with this much gold, another guy doesn't start with any gold. You can also go online. You can do online. two on one, three on one, seven on one. You can go online and on download two. all sorts of campaigns, scenarios, races, rules extensions, everything. You can make every, everything you want also. I mean, in sum, if you call yourself a PC gamer and you have not played the Battle for Wesnoth, not only are you missing out on one of the best PC games out there right now, but you're missing out on one of the best turn-based strategy games ever. And one of the only good free open source games. Because <laughs> while open source software is awesome... Open uh, source games are perhaps the worst things ever. Well, most of them are, anyway. We spent 90... a whole day. We're going to do a show on this later. We spent a day looking for open source games that were good. Me, Scott, and Alex sat here. Just each one of us picking games and trying to play them. And the fact that some of these games, none of us was able to make them work let alone play them or enjoy them. I got some of them to play, but they were just bad. Yeah. Like, unplayable. I mean, like you, I could get them to run and function. But, but some we couldn't get to function. Some we couldn't get to function. Or some there was only a server and we couldn't find the client. Yeah, yeah. So anyone out there knows any open source games besides Wesnoth that are good and worth playing, uh, let us know. I mean, I know a few of them. There's, like, uh, there's a few R uh, FPSs out there that are pretty good, but it's not much else. <laughs> I highly recommend this game. If you have trouble with it, try playing one of the easy scenarios or maybe read some of the instructions so you'll learn how to actually play. There are instructions in the game. Yeah, if you do, what's the one campaign that's supposed to be the main campaign? Why, that would be Heir to the Throne. Yeah, so if you've never played this game before, you probably want to play at least the first half of the Heir to the Throne campaign because that's the original one that tells you how to play in the early missions and it, it takes, you know, it gives you progressively more and more stuff. You know, it's like, oh, here, starting this easy mission where you just have to walk to the other end of the map. See, though, at the same time, that campaign later on gets a little bit arbitrary and annoying. It I is. I it, didn't like it's it. It's not the best campaign, I will agree, but if you've never played, it is the learning campaign. Yes. However, the South Guard, especially if you set it to one of the easier difficulties, is also an excellent learning campaign because it starts you with just peasants and then you get other units from there. And the South Guard will teach you how to play the game if you are smart enough to take a cue from the game and look at what's going on. Yeah. The Tale of Two Brothers is the incredibly short and easy campaign I talked about before. Yes. Play this game. I almost guarantee if you like turn-based strategy games at all, you'll like Wesnoth. Yeah, and if, if you, you like, don't, if you're if not you like, a human being and you like shitty games. Yeah, if you like fantasy war games, you'll also like this probably. Yeah. Now, granted, it doesn't have to be fantasy. The system is set up to be that way. You could reskin this game and redo it to make it spaceships fighting if you want it. You could make it freaking blobs of goo versus... Well, it is, in fact, blobs of goo in one of the campaigns. Uh, it's true. <laughs> I haven't it's... played through much of that one yet. No. Nah. Also, if you go to the Wikipedia, uh, I'll warn you, some of the campaigns have better art than other ones. That's just due to the fact that it's open source. So if you're a good artist out there, if you want to make a little bit of a name for yourself and you don't have one yet... Submit art to Wesnoth. If you're good, they'll take it, and they'll put it in the game. Yeah, you should see the art in some of the older versions of Wesnoth. Oh, God. Basically, it's like the game had art, you know, had icons for all the units and everything, and then they slowly go through, like, you know, one at a time, making things better, and then they just make things better in random places. One, You know, it's the nature of an open-source game, and the game is constantly coming out with new versions. One thing that is annoying is if you don't have the same exact version as all your friends, you can't play against each other. Because, like, right now I've got Feisty Fawn, so my version of Wesnoth is, like, super new, and everyone else is still running Edgy Eft. 
Yeah, so there that's was only, not only ever a problem if you decide to run beta versions of Linux operating systems. Well, you have to because the other ones don't work on your laptop as well. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. That, because of you, we couldn't play some Wesna. What you gonna do? It's not my fault you're using the old busted uh Well, you know what we did? Ubuntu's. We just played Wesnoth without you. That's fine. I had more important things to do, like yeah. laundry. But I say this because on the Wikipedia page, I might go edit this, but I'll wait so you can all see it. There is a picture of a lich. And I gotta say, it's one of the silliest looking liches I've ever seen. Yeah. Another thing, Wesnoth actually, I don't know who made the music, but it's not bad. It's also gotten a lot better recently. Yeah, the music has been changed and is better now. It's still it's not the kind of music that you'll be like dancing to, and it's not super awesome like the civilization music, but it's getting there. It's definitely to the point where it's not annoying and you won't just turn it off in frustration. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.